Antonio de Ulloa came into the world in Seville in the year 1716. On a street in the heart of Seville which now carries his name, Almirante Ulloa, but was known as Clavel at the time. Antonio epitomizes the enlightened individual, possessing a profound curiosity and a strong desire to contribute to his nation. His biographer, Francisco Solano, remarked that the life of Antonio de Ulloa was a narrative of a single passion, zeal for reform. Antonio was only 14 years old when he had his first experiences at sea. Experiences that would lead him to cross the Atlantic and even participate in military naval expeditions in the Mediterranean for two years. Thus began a very strong connection with the sea and navigation. Upon his return, he obtained a place at the Royal Academy of Marine Guards of San Fernando, today the headquarters of the San Fernando Observatory of the Navy. The Academy had been recently created to provide mixed scientific practical training to future officers of the Spanish Navy. At only 19 years old, he was chosen, along with another midshipman named Jorge Juan, as representative of the Spanish crown in the scientific expedition that, commissioned by the Paris Academy of Sciences, was to measure the length of one degree of the meridian in lands from the equator. The object of this expedition was to definitively establish the shape of the Earth, which was a source of disputes among supporters of Newton, who claimed that the Earth was flattened at the poles, and supporters of Descartes, who argued that he was around the equator. Thus began a journey in the company of French savants, who surpassed them in age and knowledge, at whose intellectual level they knew how to put themselves in a short time. In addition to measurement tasks, they were tasked with other political and military missions, such as preparing reports on the situation in Spanish America or monitoring the Chilean coast. The significant challenges they encountered resulted in the expedition extending to a duration of not less than 11 years and two months. Among these difficulties were the infernal geography of the territory chosen to make the measurements, the attacks of insects, the fury of the blizzard, and the certain danger of dying from the cold in the wastelands of the mountain ranges. Added to these dangers were numerous incidents with the inhabitants and the so-called pyramid lawsuit regarding the text that should be engraved on the monument immortalizing the feat of the expedition, today called the monument to the middle of the world. The Spanish protested because the text proposed by the French ignored their participation and that of the King of Spain. It was a matter of honor in no way minor. The recognition of the participation of Spain and these sailors in this mission is today engraved on the west side of the monument. But for Ulioa and Juan, the greatest difficulty arose when the so-called War of Jenkins' Ear broke out, which faced Spain and England, and which had the South American Pacific coast as one of its scenarios. As officers who were from the Spanish Navy, they were ordered to join the Spanish contingent and confront the English squadron. No matter what, the conclusion of the journey was fast approaching. In January 1745, Ulioa and Juan set sail from Calao to Spain. Jorge would make the crossing without major complications. Antonio, aboard the Deliverance, did not have it so easy. After a journey full of difficulties, with the ship taking on water, the Deliverance rounded Cape Horn and headed north, trying to avoid the harassment of the English ships. In vain, because finally Ulioa was taken prisoner by the English. It is worth mentioning that at no point during that journey so full of dangers did Ulioa fail to note down all the data on winds, currents, and other circumstances that could be useful in the future to those who sailed those seas. Antonio, who always referred to the English in the most respectful terms, would have bitter memories of that arrest both because of the undignified treatment that the English gave him and because of the need in which he found himself to get rid of a good part of the documentation collected. 
Throughout recent years, especially maps, plans, and reports that could harm the interests of Spain. He did not get rid, however, of the purely scientific information which was made available to the governor of Louisbourg, an English-dominated American port where they arrived after their capture. A few months later, he embarked from Louisbourg to England, where things began to improve, thanks mainly to his friendship with Sir Martin Fox, president of the Royal Society. Martin Fox not only managed to get Ulioa to recover his papers, but also proposed Ulioa's own admission to that scientific academy, one of the most prestigious in the world. After which he was able to flee to return to Spain 11 years, two months after having embarked on Cadiz. Once in Madrid, Ulioa and Juan publicized the expedition to which they had dedicated so many years of their lives, publishing the historical report of the voyage to South America, a monument of the Spanish printing press of that century, one of the most important in the history of Spanish science, which will have editions in French, English, Dutch, and German. It is in this book where he introduces a new chemical element, platinum. After writing in detail the chemical and mineralogical characteristics of a stone classified by him as platina, upon the successful completion of the Meridian Measurement Project, Ulioa is swiftly assigned fresh responsibilities that diverge significantly in scope, including tasks tied to the engineering of structures aimed at educating and training Spaniards on various models of port and river infrastructure across Europe as well as political assignments in Spanish America. In this latter role, he embarked once more to oversee the quicksilver mines in Juan Cavalica and subsequently took on the administration of Louisiana for a two-year period. A territory that had been transferred from France to Spain. In Louisiana, Antonio married the young Lima native Francisca Ramrez de Laredo, with whom he had six children. The settlers from France residing in Louisiana were not willing to recognize the newly established authorities, compelling Ulioa to depart the capital city, New Orleans, along with his spouse and eldest daughter, and make their way towards Spain. These episodes are followed by a reasonably calm period. In 1776, he is appointed commander of the Navy and Fleet of New Spain, which begins the Third American Stage in which Ulioa will give free rein to his talent as a scientist, carrying out geographical studies in Mexico, and even taking advantage of one of the Atlantic crossings to measure a solar eclipse. Our man had suffered firsthand the unpleasantness inherent in holding positions of responsibility, and in his memory he kept complaints and accusations that over time proved to be unfounded. The most dreadful, however, was still on the horizon. Everything unfolded in 1779 as a result of the Campaign of the Thirds undertaken by the Spanish Navy against the British in the area around the Azores. A tempest that severely harmed the fleet, along with a lack of supplies and the devastating effects of scurvy, compelled Ulioa to leave the Azores and head back to Cadiz. There, he was met with the unwelcome shock of having to confront three military trials between 1780 and 1782. Ulioa will emerge unscathed from those trials where he and many saw a setup designed to discredit him. But in his responses during the trial, and in the extensive memorial he wrote to vindicate his righteous conduct and his honorability, one can guess the unspeakable suffering he felt when his honor was questioned. In March 1782, he was acquitted of all charges, and Ulioa was reinstated as head of the Spanish Navy. Antonio de Ulioa died in 1795. The Madrid Gazette will echo the news of his death. The September 15th concluded the Gazette's profile by stating that with the death of Antonio de Ulioa, the king had lost one of his best servants, and that the nation lost a wise man known and appreciated throughout Europe. 
Antonio de Ulloa, as a good enlightened man, compiled numerous books throughout his life, most of them with scientific content. It was his will that the set of books, as well as other types of material dedicated to study, remained together and were used for reading and study. His collection remained among his descendants for almost 150 years, and in 1864 much of his library was acquired by the Library of the University of Seville, where they remain today in the collection of its ancient fund. There are so many characteristics of this enlightened civilian that we cannot help but be proud of his legacy and that his name crowns the cry Antonio de Ulloa. Located at the Reina Mercedes campus of the University of Seville, a center that reflects the spirit of this scientist, with its collection of books from a wide variety of scientific disciplines and its advanced resources for learning and research,